Hi, everybody. We have a special guest this week. I would like to introduce all of you to one of my PO colleagues that I didn't even know until this past week. This is Sharon Hamill Bush. Some of you have seen her new postings on the Keepers page. And of course, we were all curious because she seemed to know a lot. And so Sharon is gracious enough to share her story with us. So welcome, Sharon. Thank you. Thank you. I hope I can be of some help. I think you will. Absolutely. So the first thing I'm going to ask you to do is just to share with us how you got to know Sister Russell and Sister Kathy. I uh, went to Archbishop Keogh High School. I was in the first class of 1965 when it started. Kathy was my English teacher and Russ was my math teacher. It was a student teacher relationship for four years. And then when Kathy and Russ decided to leave the convent in June of 1969, after our graduation, I became very close with Russell. Not so much with Kathy. I knew Kathy and they were roommates, but Russell was a very close friend of mine and my family's. And you had already graduated from Keogh, is that correct? Yes, I graduated in June of 1969. And then were you getting ready for college? What were you going to do? Yes, I was getting ready to go to college to Frostburg in the fall. I went briefly, but then I came home. So I wasn't there very long, maybe four or five weeks. It didn't work out for me. So I came home and I took a year off of college before I, I went back again. I worked for that year. The summer after you graduated was the summer that Kathy and Russ left Theo and moved into the carriage house apartments. Did you see them at all during the summer? Oh, yeah. We went over. My mom also had gone over several times to just help them out with any household items that they might need and to help them get settled in. And I knew Russ. We were friends anyway from before she left the convent. She used to come over to my mother's house on Sunday, sometimes for dinner. She helped me with my prom dress my senior year and helped me with fittings and that kind of thing. And we were just friends. Our friendship was beginning that senior year, especially. And so she was over. My father used to help her after they left with her car repairs, with some oil changes, that type of thing. I saw them off and on when I wasn't working and they were teachers, so they weren't working in the summer. They wouldn't start up and take their new jobs until the fall. So I was over there quite a bit. We didn't always, I wasn't always at the apartment. Sometimes we went out shopping or We would go out to get a bite to eat or she'd come over to my house. And and so it was just a friendship that was starting. And we tried to help out with things that they needed. That's really kind. And nobody, it's interesting that you've come and agreed to talk with us because there are probably other people that had similar experiences and didn't think that it would be important to talk about, that it could help. I'm sure. We really appreciate you doing this. As the school year began... Did you, now, did you say you were at Frostburg when the school year began? Yeah, when the school year began, I went to, I started out at Frostburg. I wasn't quite sure what I wanted to do at that point, but a lot of my fellow students were going to Frostburg. I applied, I got in and I went. But when I got up there, the courses that I was able to take weren't exactly, it was where there was room for me in the courses. And I I didn't exactly feel that I fit in. Just, I guess, probably some homesick looking back on it now. Just decided to come home and wait and really think about what I wanted to do for a year. When did you come back from Frostburg? It was probably the end of September, beginning of October. We started, I went up there at the end of August, I believe. 50 years is a little rusty, but I believe it was, (laughs) we started at maybe at the end of August to actually get checked in and then register. And then I was probably up there maybe a month, but I'm not quite sure the exact Mm -hmm. date. And then you came back and lived at home again? Yes. Yes. I just came back home. You told me that your family lived not far from Carriage House. Is that correct? My my father and mother, they had a home on Regina Drive between Arbutus and Catonsville, right near UMBC College. And then my mother at the time was separated from my dad. She had an apartment across from Our Lady of Victory Church in the Meadowland apartment. And she lived there for a couple of years during this period of time. So that kind of brings us up to the fall of that year, October and November, did did you pick up your friendship with the sisters? Oh, yeah. Yeah, Yeah. it never really, it never went away. I definitely saw her more. I considered her my best friend now. Since I was an 18-year-old high school graduate and still a young young kid, and she was out in the world at, I guess, the age of 25 or 26, it was more of a big sister 
friendship type of thing. I still looked up to her a lot, but we did have, we did enjoy doing things together. And, Mm -hmm. and I think it was a friendship that was growing. And in fact, we did stay close until after my marriage in 1973. Sharon, you mentioned that you graduated the class of 1969 at Keogh. Did you have any idea of the abuse that was going on there at that time? Nothing, nothing, not the slightest of inkling. I had the best four-year high school education that I could ever imagine. It was the best four years. When I graduated from there, I was sad. So I was excited because I was graduating, but it was the best time, best of times. I had no inkling of anything. I knew nothing. How did your friendship with Sister Russell start? Was it while you were, while she was your teacher? Oh, yeah, definitely. I really liked her as a teacher to start with. But then I was also, the school had a lot of extracurricular activities after school, different clubs, choral club. There was the CMSD. I'm trying to remember exactly what it, it was a Catholic Mission Students Association, I believe. We would do just, we would meet after school and have meetings. We would do different things around the school to that had to do with our Catholic faith. We did fundraiser type things, or we would do, we'd help out in the chapel setting up for church if there was going to be a, a little bit of a mass for some reason or you know if there was any anything that they needed us to do we would take over that type of responsibilities and it was just it was a fun club to be in and it was after school and sister russell sister ignatius before she changed her name was the moderator of that club so that's how i got started to know her in a different way of just being a math teacher now how did you start to get to know sister kathy Sister Kathy was the same type of situation. She was my English teacher, and she also had the drama club. And I was in The Sound of Music, one of the plays that she had put on. I was in the choral club, and as such, we were part of The the Sound of Music. And so we would have after-school practices, and we would have other activities that had to do with the drama club that got me to know her because she was also the moderator of that club. And then she was just a very vivacious, outgoing friendly young nun that everybody loved. She was probably one of the favorites, if not the favorite, of all of the nuns at the school at that time. She was a very outgoing, she was somebody you could go to and talk to. She was somebody that helped you and was kind and still strict in the classroom. She was no nonsense when it came to to classwork and schoolwork, but yet she could, you felt she could be a friend as well. So Sister Kathy and Sister Russell were pretty good friends, and they were also teachers at Keogh. What were the differences and similarities and personalities? I would say Sister Sister Russ was much quieter and more subdued as far as her outgoing, her nature, but yet she was also the cheerleading coordinator and moderator and captain or whatever you'd call her. She taught the cheerleading for the basketball team, the cheerleaders that were at Keogh, and so she was very more athletic and more, she was very good with the students, but on a quieter, less emotional way. Sister Kathy was more of the drama. She did the drama. And so she was, she would, if you had to pick who would cry more, it would be Sister Kathy would probably shed a tear before Russ would or Mm -hmm. Sister Russell. That was just their personalities were more, Russ was more of a private person and not real expressive and demonstrative. Although she could be very funny and was a lot of fun to be around. She just wasn't super loud or very outspoken in in her feelings. Kathy, on the other hand, was very sensitive, was a good word, I guess, to des- describe her. Very sensitive, very sympathetic and empathetic. She could be very good with helping people with their problems. Did they become very good friends early on at Q? I believe, I believe so. I can't say as a student back then, you don't see people, the nuns, but they were together a lot walking down the halls or in between things. You'd see them talking and I would say that they were friends but I didn't see their life in the convent behind the scenes. So I really couldn't say for sure what their relationship is friendship. But then in our senior year, since they decided to leave the convent together and become roommates in an apartment, I would assume that they were very good friends to begin with. Your friendship with Sister Russell, was it much stronger than with Sister Kathy? Definitely. Yeah. Sister Russell, it was very, there was a true friendship. And with Kathy, I admired Kathy and I was very, a little bit in awe of her because she's so talented with her, with the drama and the music and just everything. I was friends with her in the fact that she was over at the apartment when Russ was there and I would stop in and see her. It was Russ that I'd gone over to see and Kathy was there. So the friendship was more, for me, it was more towards Russ just because of that's the way it grew. What do you remember about 
when you heard that they were leaving the school and going to a public school or public life in the apartment? At first, we were surprised because as students, I would guess that my first impression was they're nuns. How do you not be a nun anymore? How do you just leave? But that part, I, back then, the religious, there were so many more Catholic nuns and priests and brothers that you figured it's like marriage once you're in for, for life. And so my first thought was of surprise that they would leave. But then they were young women and they had talked about at first trying to go out in the ministry into the world still as nuns and still but to live in the lay world so that they could get a better view of the reality of the real world outside of being sheltered in a convent and still become still be religious women but when i believe when they asked permission for that it was not granted in that way they were it was either you stay with us or you leave there's none of this you can go out and live in an apartment and still be a nun so they still chose to leave. So they asked for permission to do it? Yes, they did initially. I know they asked for permission. Uh, I know that from Russell. The permission wasn't granted officially. They weren't told you leave with our blessing. It was more of, if you leave, we wish you well, but we aren't going to condone this. I guess they didn't want all the nuns running off and starting their own little apartment convent. So they uh, did not give them a blessing to do it. In retrospect, do you think there were other factors that guided their decision to leave? Hindsight's twenty twenty. So I, if I look back and I think now, because of what I know now, I'm sure it had to have some bearing on it, at least with Kathy. I don't know who, I'm not sure to this day who knew first, but I'm believing that it was Kathy. Russell never gave me any indication that she knew anything and that there was anything going on. Absolutely nothing. There were never any discussions to me. Now, I was 18 years old at the time, so I would probably be one of the last that they would discuss their life changes with. That would be something I would imagine they would talk over with their peers. And I know that they were given until the end of the calendar year to make that decision, whether or not to go back or to leave completely. Kathy told her family, you know, it's more mm-hmm. dangerous for me to stay at Keo than it is to teach in a city school. So that I didn't know. know. Yeah, that I didn't know. But it makes sense now when I think about it. But I know that as they left, they were trying to, I would guess now looking back that they were making it try to appear to be just a normal decision between two women who decide they want to move on and be outside the convent. There was never any indication to me that when I was with Russ on any occasion doing anything from going out to lunch with her or to sitting in the apartment, did I ever feel that she was afraid of anything or that there was anything on her mind that was worrying her? I never had that impression. And like I said, I didn't see Kathy enough in a social setting other than hello and goodbye. And and she might be grading papers or something in the apartment when I was there, but there was never any discussions about what either of them were going through ever. This is an odd question, but before we move on, Sharon, do you remember if either one of them brought their habit with them when they left? I honestly never saw it. I never saw anything in their closets or anything. I was back, never in Kathy's room, really, but in Russ's room, I'd been back there several times. And in fact, I had lent her some of my clothes at the time we were about the same size. And I lent her sweaters and different things on occasion, like if she had something she was doing and she just didn't have a huge wardrobe at that point, say, oh, do you, you know, do you have this or that I could borrow? And, and I'd say, sure. And I'd I'd bring it over. That probably was what I had come over for that, that one day I can't remember, but I used to drop things off to her from time to time. I never saw her habit hanging in her closet. If she had it, she could have had it in a dresser drawer or something, but I'm not aware of it. A lot of people have asked, so I figured it sounds like you yes. might have known. So. It's mm-hmm. not something that I ever saw again. It's not that they ever wore it, that's for sure. I never saw them wearing it ever again. Mm-hmm. But as to whether they brought it, it was a modified habit at that point anyway. They were wearing mostly like navy blue skirts, white blouses with the very shortened veil that they would wear that did show some of their hair, that kind of thing. But it was a smaller habit. And I don't know if they kept it. I never saw it. Leading up to when they moved into the carriage house apartments, are you aware of the reason why they picked those apartments? I'm guessing that they really don't know. I don't know how many they looked at or how they came upon that particular apartment. I do know that when they said they were moving, that they had that address, they had that apartment already picked out. So I'm not sure who helped them with that. But I do believe it was because it was close. Kia was close by. 
And the people that they knew in the general area were in that area. So I don't think they wanted to venture and go real far away or start something exceptionally long distance from from where they were used to, the Catonsville area. So I believe that had part of the bearing. And whether they had both got jobs lined up that summer, I'm not sure if the apartment came first or the jobs. I do know that Kathy was at Western High School. Russell was right up the street from the apartment at the North Bend, I Correct. believe, middle school. Rockland, yep. Rockland. Junior Rockland. High. Rockland, yeah, right there. So that was close. And I'm not sure if they got the apartment and then she applied for the job or whether she had the job and that apartment turned out to be perfect. So I'm not really sure which came first. Now, I know that you and Gemma both went to Keogh, which, of course, is a Catholic school. And so your knowledge, both of your knowledge is with how nuns work would be much more than mine. For both of you, does this seem out of the normal for two nuns who are teaching at a Catholic school to possibly leave, but they're moving out, they're getting an apartment, and they're starting to teach in a public school? Does that seem odd to you guys, or was that normal practice? It wasn't unusual to me after they said it. I was a little surprised at first because they were such great nuns and such great teachers. And you look up to them. It was a surprise to hear they weren't going to do that. Looking back on the facts of things that have happened, if both of them were in fear for something and knew that there was something bigger going on around them and they chose to get away from it, that to me would seem very reasonable that they would venture out of the convent versus being surrounded by. So much evil. Yeah. And what we know is that at least one student went to Kathy. And as you mentioned, when we look back in hindsight, now that we know all of these things that happened, it is very curious how that ended up being. But when they moved into the carriage house apartments, would you say that you and Russ were best friends at that point? I would say so. And that was a pretty good description of the way I felt. You'd have to ask her, but we definitely did have a strong relationship, friendship wise. And It went on more to the point where even in 1971, as a Christmas present that year, Russ gave me a trip to Florida to Disney World was opening. Her uncle Iggy invited me down to stay with her parents and to spend a week down there. It was after the school year. I believe it was her daughter's, uh, not her daughter, her sister, Russ's sister, Mary, was graduating high school. And she had invited us down for the graduation and for a week to spend. So I think Our friendship was close enough that for her to do something like that, she considered me a friend as well as I considered her a friend. I did think it was unusual, and I had never heard of it before. I had cousins who, it was three sisters that were, they were siblings, and they were all nuns. And so I knew a lot of nuns and sisters. I had them in grade school, and I had never heard of anybody leaving. But as Sharon said, it was the 60s. And there was a lot going on. The Catonsville, I'm sure they knew some of the people that were involved in the Catonsville Nine who burned the Exactly. Yeah. In fact, I know they knew a couple of those priests. But anyway, I always thought if they were leaving because of what was happening there and they couldn't help those girls that were confiding in them, I thought they would have moved away somewhere else, like out of danger themselves. But then Mm -hmm. thinking about that, I guess it makes sense that they weren't too far away because they knew that there were young women and maybe some young guys from the Catholic high schools who were depending on them for help. So I think they maybe wanted to be accessible, but not wanting to live in a convent where perhaps other faculty members or other clergy were involved in what was going down. It does to me, too, when I think about it. I also feel that their staying in the immediate area, like you said, gave access for other students to come by and talk if they wanted to. So I can't say that I ever saw a huge number of people in and out of the apartment. I really never did. It was a quiet life that they had left when I was there. There wasn't any wild parties or anything that I ever experienced seeing myself between them at all. If I went over for an evening, we would They'd be sometimes grading papers for classes the next day or whatever. We just, it was a quiet life, but they were close by. So it was accessible to a lot of people that that still had friendships with them, I'm sure. When we spoke last, you mentioned that Russell didn't have a man in her life at that point. 
what did you know about Sister Kathy's relationship with Jerry? I didn't think of it either as a relationship that she had with them that were always around from being at school. So her having a friendship with one was not unusual at all. I didn't think that there was anything other than a friendship. I never saw anything. There wasn't any flirting or any cutesy stuff that you would think that this is boyfriend, girlfriend. I never witnessed any of that. And never, I knew that Russ didn't have a boyfriend. There was She wasn't dating or anything. I knew that because I knew her. But as far as Kathy goes, I can't say for sure that she was or wasn't because I didn't really spend that much close time, one-on-one time with her. But I never saw anything, any evidence to show that they were boyfriend, girlfriend, nothing at all, ever. A friendship, but not anything more than that. Did you ever see other adults in the apartment when at times that you were there? I'm trying to look back and remember anything, and I really don't remember. There were students once in a while. There'd be someone, I, I can't even recall who they were anymore, but there'd be people that would stop in and say hi or be over for a little bit. But I never saw any adults or any really anybody else. Russ's Uncle Iggy, I think, was over there once or twice in the beginning when she was getting set up. But I honestly don't can't recall anybody in particular that came over to the apartments. What about neighbors? Do you remember ever running into anybody outside the... No, I would park in the... I parked in the parking lot right behind her building and walk in. So over, over the time, once in a while, I guess if there were people walking past, you'd say hi. But I never formally met any of them and I didn't know the names of any of them. So I really can't say that I knew. It was just I'd go straight to Russ's apartment and that was it. What can you tell us about her uncle? A very nice, kind man. Very nice. He was a single man. I don't believe that he had ever been married, but he lived in the Towson off Stevenson Road area off the Beltway. My mother and I, we had gone up there to dinner with Russ and her uncle Iggy once or twice and very nice, just very nice man. Very kind, professional man. I'm not exactly sure what his job was. I can't remember. He always dressed. He was always in a suit of course, blacks and a dress shirt. So he always dressed professionally and was very friendly and nice and just kind. That's the best way I can describe him was just a kind man. Is your mom still living, Sharon? No, she passed away in 2009. Did you guys ever talk about any of this? We talked. Yeah, my mom was very upset when Kathy disappeared and was just, oh my gosh, she was just destroyed, very upset. But we talked about it, but we could never... Our biggest thing, we would always say, who would ever want to hurt Kathy? And nobody, it was never a thought. We had no idea. We couldn't imagine. And that was pretty much where the conversation would go. We just couldn't imagine. We just never, until this stuff started to come out, my mother was alive when when there was talk of things, the abuse and stuff. And she, she found it very difficult to understand. She says, how in God's name could anybody ever do that? And it just was very upsetting to her. But we never, ever thought of anything that they ever knew anything ahead of time was never discussed in front of us by either one of them. We were in in as much ignorance of it as anybody else. We we really did not know. Mm -hmm. And we we were right there with her, but we just never suspected one minute of anything. Before we talk about the weekend that she disappeared, what were your impressions of Joseph Maskell and Neil Magnus? Because both of them were at Keo when you were there. Right. They were at Keo. All I can say, I really have the least opinion of anybody. I saw them in the school. We would, they would have a mass for when we had masses in the auditorium or for whatever reason, they would have religious services or whatever. And then I knew that Father Maskell was the chaplain for the school. So I know he had an office there. I was never in his office as far as anything personal one-on-one with him ever. I never had reason to. I was never called down to his office. I was never, I just knew that he was there. And he would be, he'd walk around the floors of the building. We would see him as part of the staff there. He was, his presence was known, but I can't say that I had an opinion about him one way or the other. I can't say that I really liked him. It was just, he was there and it was like, eh, okay. I didn't ever think of him as being overly friendly. How about Magnus? Magnus, I really didn't know at all. Don't know when he came there. And I guess I saw him around, but I didn't really have any, really any contact with him. I really have no opinion of him. If it's okay with you, Sharon, we're going to talk about the day that Kathy disappeared and that weekend. So are you okay with walking us step by step? To the best of my memory, I will do the best I can. There are some things that are ingrained in my brain that will never go away, no matter how hard I would try. And there's other things that are just gone. 
I just don't have a memory of it. So if you can walk us through that, I guess, 24 hours, help us with the timeline, because this is going to be new information for everybody. Whatever I can do to help from what from what my perspective of it was that weekend. Now, you were not in school because you had come home from Frostburg, right? Correct. So were you working that Friday? That uh, I, I worked. They taught school, so they had been to school. And then for some reason, I don't know whether it was a sweater. There was something I dropped off that day over to her after I got home. I don't know. I think I worked 8 to 4 or 4.30, so I would have gotten home probably 5, 5.30. And I just ran something over to her, to Russ. And I believe it was a sweater that she had wanted to borrow from me. And I just dropped it off and I didn't stay long. They were going to grab a bite to eat. And then Kathy was going to go out to the store up to Edmondson Village. That's pretty much the closest place to go shopping at the time. It was Hutzler's that was there at the time. And she was going to pick up a gift for her sister. She did tell you that she was going shopping for her sister. I believe that it was her sister. Yes. Okay, yes, her sister. Somebody, but you didn't just mm-hmm. that, In her family. Like, it was a family. Mom, so yeah. That. Yes. It was a family yeah. gift she was picking up. Did you go inside the apartment? Yeah. I was in there for a few minutes just standing around. I didn't, I don't recall that was, there wasn't anything that evening that we did in the way of any activities. It was just a drop off for a few minutes and then, and then left. They were tired. It's a week at the end of the week on a Friday and they're in school. They were tired after the weekend and they were, they, there wasn't any major plans going on or anything they were going out to do, except she was going to just go to the bank and then run that one errand and come home. There wasn't any, there wasn't anything that anybody else had planned to do. There wasn't anybody coming over that I was aware of. And so that was it. It was a quick, innocent, nothing. Me, it was, you know, inconsequential. Do you recall any difference in their demeanor? None. At all? Nope, not at all. Did you speak? They were both home when you got there? Yeah, they were both home when I got there, but they were going to, Russ, I don't think had any plans to go out at all. Kathy was just going to run to the bank and run to the store. And neither one of them, the time from the time they left the convent until that particular night, I never knew them to be late night going out really much anywhere. They went, if they did something together or if they had, if we had plans to go out to dinner or something, we'd come back. Sure, it would be after dark or whatever, but we, they never were late night people to go out and do a lot of things and come home late at night. Mm-hmm. Once they came in, early evening would be about the end of it and they were in. So I would imagine she would have gone over to the bank and the banks back then they didn't have these ATM machines or any of those. You went into the bank and on Friday night, they had a courtesy of staying open till about seven, just so you could do paycheck banking. And so I would imagine she would have had to get to the bank before seven if if, if it closed at that point, like most right. of them did. And then she would go on to the stores that were open till probably nine o'clock. We do know that the police have the receipt from her making her deposit. What bank did you tell me that you thought Russell used? I'm sure Russell used the First National in Catonsville, right on Frederick Road. It was on the Bloomsbury side, on the corner there. That's where Russ did her banking. And I thought that Kathy did too, but apparently she used a different bank. The place you're talking about also used to be an equitable. It Maybe it was. I thought it was the First National. That was my thought, but I know where the building was. I guess I thought it was the equitable at the Edmonton Village. Go on from there. You left the apartment. Okay, I left the apartment and I just went home. So I don't, after that, I went home. And later on that evening, I didn't talk to Kathy at Russ after that at all or see Kathy or anything. I just went home. And I guess I probably had dinner with my family. And then I remember that I was up in my room getting ready for bed. And I had, it was a big deal back then. I have your own phone in your room. So I had my own phone and it rang. It was about 10 o'clock at night. I was on the same line as my parents' phone, but I had my own extension. And I answered it and it was Russ. And she was just asking me if I had heard anything. Did Kathy call me or had I seen her? That she was just trying to look because she was worried that she hadn't come home yet. And she had just gone out to go to the store and to the bank and should definitely have been home by then. Did you stay on the phone long with her? Maybe a few minutes, not a real long period of time. We went over the time she was only going to go to the bank and she was only going to go to the store. So how long could she take? And the stores close around nine. Yeah, it's 10. She should be home. Maybe she stopped, saw somebody and maybe they went for coffee or something. I don't know, just chit chat about possibly where she could be. And I said, no, I have not seen her. I haven't heard from her. I haven't done anything, but I was home all evening. I haven't talked to anybody. So that was the end of that. And she did say, I think I'm going to call the police. I should call the police. And I think she also said that she was going to call Jerry Koob and 
Pete McKeon because they were they were at Manresa. I can't remember whether she said she was going to call both of them, but I do know she said she was going to call Jerry Coob and see if maybe he could come over and help her look for. Her. Mm-hmm. They were going to go. They were going to, I guess, go out and try to see where she was. Russ couldn't go anywhere by herself because Kathy had the car. It was Russell's car, but they both used it, and so. Kathy used it for the errands that night. And so Russ was literally home with no means to get in her car and go out anywhere. So I would imagine she, she called maybe um, Jerry Coop just because she wanted him to come over and he had a car and maybe they could go look for her. Do you remember her saying that? Yeah, I just remember she, she wanted to go and look and see, see if she could maybe backtrack. Maybe she had car trouble. Maybe you were thinking of a million things at that point of where she could be and what could have happened. At that point, it was just a matter of where is she was. I don't think anybody was thinking in terms of something. I wasn't thinking in terms of something bad happened. I was thinking in terms of maybe the car broke down. Maybe she stopped and met somebody that she ran into and they were going to have stopping it a bite to eat or so. Who knows? But it was just a, it was only an hour at that point from when the store would have closed. And so it was more of a why isn't she home yet conversation versus being panicked. It sure. was worry. It was worry that it's not like her. And that's why Russ called me. I'm sure that's why Russ called me was because it's not like her to be out that late and not let somebody know that she's okay. There were no cell phones back then. You did the communication isn't like it is today where it's instantaneous. Back then people could go out for hours and you wouldn't hear from them, but they'd come back in and they'd tell you where they'd been and what they'd been doing. You didn't have a phone at your fingertips every minute. You would show back up. So at that point it wasn't horrible worry, but it was concern. She was going to do the things that she thought to help see if they could see where she went. And then after that, I hung up and I just said, well, let me know as soon as you hear something. Because I don't remember that I slept well that night. I was worried because I hadn't, I didn't hear back from her the rest of the night. So I didn't hear anything one way or the other. So I was just waiting. If she knew something one way or the other, she would call me. I wasn't going to bug her. And then what happened the next day? I believe that she called me to come over. I don't remember whether I called her or she called me. That Those are still blurry in my brain. I do know that I went over early to her apartment. When I got there and parked my car, I know that the detectives were inside her apartment. There were definitely people inside her apartment. Jerry, I didn't know Pete McKeon as much as Jerry Coop just to recognize when I saw them. And so Jerry was there. I guess Pete was too, but I don't really recall his face. It's just a blank in my brain. But there were other people there too. I don't know if I can't really recall who they were. I don't know if it was other like friends at Kathy or something. I don't really know. It just seemed like there were people in the apartment and I can't really recall who they all were. But the detectives were definitely there. And then the detectives were there and Russell introduced me or just said that this police officer would like to, or this detective would like to ask you a couple questions. And so I said, sure, whatever, you know, I was, I walked into seeing the policeman and that was more upsetting to me because I knew something really bad was, had happened, but I didn't know what. And it was a case of just sure, whatever anybody can do to help. I. So they asked my name, asked me how I knew Kathy and little stuff like that. And then just said, did anybody at Archbishop Keogh ever do anything to you that you didn't want them to do? Join us next week for part two of Bombshell, The Man in the Trench Coat.